Good evening, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to another episode of Paint Desk Rumblings. Tonight, I'll do my first deep dive into the fluff, the background of the Ninth Age. I'm hoping that there will be more of these episodes, so I'm adding a subtitle to this, to this one um, called Fluff Focus. In this instance, I will be talking about the uh, Nine Ages of the world from the Dawn Age up to to now, now in the setting. Uh, basically the um, main source for this is the World Hymn in the main rulebook, but I will be bringing up other sources too that have given some insight into the different ages and such. But before we get into, into that we have the Hobby Spotlight. And on my desk tonight, I have shields, eight of them. Just need to shake up the bottle a little. Um, they are for my vermin swarm army. And they come in the in the kits of the Triari and the Has Hasdati uh, from Dra Dragon Claw miniatures. So they are, they are the same stuff as the rest of my Vermin Swarm army. And I'm paint, painting them up in a very classical Roman style. As you can see, I'm showing an image on the screen. Um, they are already base coated, all of them, and uh, some basic shading is done to them as well. So I will be doing highlights and freehands on them today. So, um, yeah, one of them is already finished, you can see that too. Uh, so hopefully they, they will all look like that by the end of this. And um, if I get, if I finish sooner than that, I will move on to some, to basing some of my Vermis Warm paint. I'm, re I'm repainting the other bases too. To snow basing, uh, so yeah, again, uh, as I've spoken about, I've finally figured out how, I'd, how I'm doing their, their shields and their bases, so I'm moving moving on with the army, which is nice. So, on to the next segment, news. And we can start with some miniature news, pun very much intended. Um, in that category we have... Uh, TMS, Tabletop Miniature Solutions. They are having a sale on their uh, Aspir Knights Aspirant. So you can get five of them for 30 euro. Normally it's five for 40. Um, still fairly expensive I'd say, but they are really nice miniatures. Or Well, I have some of the TMS Knights uh, of Equitane. Not the aspirant, aspirant, I think, and I haven't assembled or built them any uh, uh, yet, but they look like very nice sculpts and uh, costs. So, if you're up for that, go check it out. I'll include a link below. Uh, and as a little bonus with the uh, TMS miniatures, you always get uh, scenic bases with them, which is nice. So, check those out. Uh, next we have uh, Lubart miniatures. They are continuing to release um, or continuing their their Undying Dynasties range. Um, if they haven't seen it before, you should go check it out. They have an awesome range of of Greek themed uh, undeads that are perfect for Undying Dynasties. If you want something a little different, um, now they are uh, releasing uh, teaser photos of upcoming product products. The latest was the uh, Great Vultures and the uh, Scorpions. And I must say that I really quite like the Scorpion model. It's similar to the Sandstalker that I've mentioned before on the show um, 
and that one was a bit curious about getting and I feel the same about this one. The Vulture, not so much, it feels a bit stale to me. But um, yeah. it can still be very useful I guess. So check those out, links down below. And the last bit is not uh, not actually miniatures then, um, it's Movement Trace by MagneticMovementTrace.com. They are expanding their range to include some new sizes of trace. Um, you can check out, I'll link a post where they introduce this um, and see if there's anything that suits your army and your needs. Myself, I will be getting a tray for my uh, light infantry with handguns in Empire of Sonstal. Um, they are in a 7 wide, 3 deep formation, and there was no option for that, so now there is. That's nice. Yeah, um, that's it for miniature news, so moving on to the big thing. Which is, of course, that the ninth scroll has been released in another, another issue, issue 17. So I won't go into super detail. Uh, I went pretty detailed last time, I think, but I ha have a pretty, pretty big main segment this time, so I'll keep it short. Um, so, to me, the most interesting things in this scroll is the Great Games of Sagyan, also known as the Orc Olympics. So we're getting a teaser here uh, of an, an upcoming game that the Night Age will be releasing. I think it will be called Orc Olympics, but in world I think it's more better known as the, the Great Games of Sagyan. We already have some back background on on this actually you can check out issue number 10 of the Night Scroll uh, where there is a text about the, the Feast of Sagyan. So it's basically the same thing but this is focused on the games that are played there. In that text you get some description about the contest of the Flaming Pigs um, which is a great artwork for in, in this issue. So that's neat. Um, there will be six different disciples and contests in the Orc Olympics. Um, suitable for rolling a d6, I suppose, but it's also intended that you can play it as a campaign and uh, participate participate in all of them. In this uh, article, they are um, giving us the ru rules for one of the, the disciplines. Uh, the Masters Fight, which is a multiplayer game where every player controls a single orc and they fight it out on a um, on a chessboard, basically. Which is quite neat because most people have one of those. Well, maybe not most people, but it's fairly common at least. Um, and it's easy to get your hands on. So it seems quite quick, quite fun. Um, I'm planning to try it out uh, with a friend when I'm hosting my next tournament in the middle of October. So fairly soon. Uh, next, in the issue we have another session with the Sage, Herr Selig. Um, and he answers more questions and discusses the topics quite a bit this time. Fairly long answers in general, which is nice. Uh, the first one is about the history of the Quathal Lords. And uh, um, it's he it goes quite in depth and uh, it's a very comprehensive source. And we'll get in <laughs> more into that later in the main segment actually. Um, so he's also asked about he's asked a few silly questions in this 
in this session um, I find that a bit anno annoying that I don't just ignore ignore these kinds of question questions but whatever so it kind of breaks my suspension of disbelief disbelief but he's asked about uh, what creature has the most hair a dwarf a wild horn or a vermin if you were to shave them um, he gives a fairly good answer uh, that doesn't really answer the question but it's uh, yeah it's a bit interesting at least uh, moving on he was also asked about the languages of v Vetia so the, the continent of Europe basically um, he gives a very good answer it's interesting I think um, not that surprising it's very similar to our own history but um, it's good to have some names on the languages and such I feel so I appreciate that next is another fa fairly silly question uh, about what bands are the most popular in social music bands that is and mm, yeah I just wish they ignored the, this one um, he's also asked about uh, humans on uh, Selida Ablen, I think it's pronounced that way, the uh, home island of the elves, um, which is an interesting topic. And he's asked about the heritage, the royal lines of the dwarves, uh, which he answers quite avoidingly. I think it's hinting that in the next next scroll, we will get some more information about dwarves. So that's nice. So, more in the issue of, uh, of this nice scroll. Um, there's some nice tactics article about formations and uh, of the, of your units, what formation to put your units in, and what what the situations. I think the general gist of it is that a lot of people are a bit too stale in how they deploy their units. It's always the same formation. I know I do that most of the time, um, but if you want to improve your, your gaming, you can experiment with different formations in different si situations. So it's uh, it's a nice article. I missed this kind of article in the scroll quite a bit. I think they add quite a bit to to the whole. So that's nice to see. And then there's a lot of coverage on the ETC, some really awesome pictures, and other stories from from it. Um, but I won't go into into detail of those. I'm sure others will do it better. <coughs> so I think that settles it for the the news. We can move on to the main segment. Uh, less in less than than 15 minutes actually. So that's nice. I just need to shake up another bottle. So, like so. Uh, and we'll continue into the main segment, the nine ages of the world. As I said, the basis for this is the world, world hymn in the main rulebook, which is a dwarven poem written in the, in the ninth age. Um, and it details all the ages. Uh, what we see in the rulebook is uh, actually a reproduction of an Equitine uh, tapestry. Uh, it's a, that is, is itself based on the world hymn. So it, it's some um, can be some interpreters errors and uh, such to safeguard them from errors uh, and inconsistencies. Um, and it's, all, it's also accompanied by a, an image for each age, which is really nice. I find that the, the, that the poem is not that informative. It's very evocative, but um, doesn't have that much, much information. But to compensate the images, as you say, um, an image says, says more than a thousand words. And these images are really detailed, so they say a lot. Uh, I will mention the images again 
because I think you can draw some conclusion about when they are made as well in in setting basically. Uh, so I, I'll show them up on the screen for each age, age as I talk about them. So we will begin with the first age. Start at the beginning, also known as the Dawn Age, fittingly. And it's so long ago that we don't really know that much about it. And very little is certain, and we don't know how long it is. It's it's basically stretches to the to the beginning of the world, which can be yeah millions of years ago. So perhaps um, we we simply don't know. Um, but the the age is mostly marked by the fact that the Saurians, the Quathals, are the masters of the world. They have a an empire stretching across the globe, and they have enslaved pretty much all the other sentient species in the. Um, in the image we can see a group of uh, elves, humans, dwarves, orcs and ogres enslaved. And this continues for who knows how long until the elves, uh, the, the slaves manage to, to rebel and set themselves free. And there are some different stories to why this manage this but in the hymn uh, and in the image the sky hammer is brought up as a reason uh, which was a comet that struck the earth and uh, wiped out <laughs> the the dinosaurs basically so there's some obvious similarity to such an event of our, our world and now I realize that maybe I used the wrong term, so I will just call this rock thing that hit the earth magma instead. Uh, so magma struck the earth and wiped out the dinosaurs. <coughs> um, as a little side note, the uh, uh, keeping the similarities in mind with the real world, it seems likely that it struck somewhere between Celexia and <coughs> and uh, Virencia, so in between South, so in the Gulf of Mexico, basically, which uh, where our, our event happened. And if if you look there on the map, that's where the Shattered Sea is which can maybe be seen as an impact crater. So it seems likely that it was created by by the sky hammer. Uh, but it re resulted in the in the slaves being freed. They revolted against their masters and managed to free themselves from spread spread around the globe. Uh, the Quathals is not much more history about them and the Saurians. There's some in this uh, latest scroll, and I think the one before that. Uh, and basically, it seems that they vanished, the Quathals at least, at this time, only to reappear uh, many ages later, uh, perhaps even in the as late in the uh, as the seventh and eighth age, somewhere around there. And it's a bit uncertain where they went, if they are the, the ones that up reappeared or even related to the ones that were in this age and all that, many different theories. Uh, some say that they w fled into the immortal realm and came back and others that they were hunted and driven to extinction. So basically a lot of different ideas, uh, which is a thing I like about this. Uh, as I said in the last episode about the, the point of view that is, it is written, they can keep this, these conflicting ideas about how things are, and you can 
pick and choose what you want to apply to your own army, which I think is nice. So, um, we shall move on to the Second Age, also known as the Golden Age. Uh, again, we don't know how long it is, but it seems that this was a fairly long age. Um, and basically, it was a prosperous time for all the species. The dwarves, they um, formed two great kingdoms, east and west, and during this age those kingdoms were also united. The great times when east wet mess, as the poem says. Um, there's also something about a great orc in this age. <coughs> Uh, the poem men mentions an orc, a fair-eyed orc, let's see here, Arkubad, I'll pronounce his name. Um, who uh, who would come and bind, it doesn't really say, it's not that clear who this orc is from the hymn, but there's also an image of an orc uh, appearing behind the the cities that they are, the dwarves are building. Um, and there are some other tales about a great orc in this ta time. In the main rule book, there's some short descriptions of all, all the factions. And the one for the orcs mentions that all the orcs were once united under a great leader in the times before the Golden Age, I think it says. And uh, this could be the same orc, I guess. How many great orcs could there have been in this time? Um, there's also some theories that this orc was act actually responsible for the downfall of the Saurians, not the comet. Or magma, I should say. Um, that's a silly reference to XKCD. For those who don't get it. Um, and there's actually a third source that mentions a great orc at this time. Uh, in the source book Circling the Abyss, they, there is a mention of um, in the circle of Vanadra, goddess of wrath. There's some incomprehensibly large monster possibly Vanadra herself, as I read it, uh, that has uh, three large mouths, each, uh, or two of them chewing on a, a great uh, betrayer of, uh, of in history, um, and the third one empty, waiting for their betrayer, its betray betrayer, and one of those who, who is chewed upon is the goblin stirred, who is said to have bet betrayed the great orc in the golden age. So maybe, again, maybe the same orc as this Arkubad. But we don't know. Um, so more in the second age. The elves, we have a source about them. Uh, from the uh, someone called the Mad Hermit, so it's perhaps not the most reliable source. But what he says seems to coincide a bit with what is shown in the imagery of the world hymn. Uh, so he tells of the, the pr primordial Fae, who lived in the forest, probably Viscan, and some of them moved out of the forest and started to build cities around the rivers and lakes um, and build towers and eventually, uh, eventually they s started sailing across the ocean and found the white islands of Selida Ablen and colonized them. Uh, some of the elves also returned back to Vetya to remain there 
and these elves countered the, the dwarves and gave them logging rights to the forest of Wiscan, which of course upset, upset the elves still living there, those who would become the Silmon elves we know today. Uh, and this part hostility between all three factions involved, the Arandai <coughs> or uh, Highborn Elves, the Dwarves and the Silver Elves, tre the Trevi. Um, also in this age the, the, the humans founded two of the greatest empire, uh, empires, that of Naptesh and that of Tsuanda. Um, at least it seems that way if you look at the imagery. So I guess that's it for um, the second age, which brings us into the third age, which is also known, known as the Age of Death and the Age of Bows. And it all, it's also the first of what is known as the Ages of Ruin which is basically all the ages from here up till the current age, the ninth age. So, as the name suggests, things start to turn a bit bad in this age. Uh, there are earthquakes, a time where, when earth would swallow whole, I think it says in the hymn. Um, and the beast herds appear, so the, the dwarfs have to start fighting them. They seek aid from the elves in Vetia, but are abandoned. They sail across the oceans instead. Um, the elves, well, uh, they are not aban abandoned immediately. The elves too want to stay there and they seek help from um, the, the rest of the em uh, their empire, the Arandai Empire, but are refused and Eventually, they are forced to migrate away from Vetia. Uh, a lot of them moving to Silexia instead, where they already have some colonies. So there seems to be on the imagery some infighting among among the elves. Maybe it's a vampire, but I think it's both elves. Uh, I don't really know. I haven't found any source about what this infighting is, um, so we don't really know. Um, if you have found something, please let me know, because I would like to know. Uh, and the last thing that happens is, or last, last I don't know what order these things take place, uh, but what also happens is the the great dying in Naptesh, which is the event where uh, the us usurper. Setesh betrays the king Fatep and uh, plunges the whole nation into civil war and eventually into undeath. Um, so that's a fairly important event. Uh, I've start, started doing some free hands now so I might be a little uh, distracted. Uh, but I think that, that does it for the third age, so we'll move on to the fourth. It's the age of iron, second age of ru ruin. Um, and it's marked by the appearance of the orcs and goblins, it seems. They haven't been, um, no, or at least they appear in greater number this time. And they start to fight the dwarves. And they seem to be responsible for splitting the the Dwarven Empire or Kingdom into two again, West and East. Which, as we will see, have, has some dire consequences. Uh, the Dwarves, they ally with the... Uh, the Avrasi Empire, the city of Avras, which is um, is appearing at this time. Um, 
so basically the Roman Empire. And the elves, they it's not really said, but they, it seems that they are starting to build their global empire through their naval force during this time. Uh, so probably setting up colonies in, in Sagarika and such. India, in other words. Uh, we also have a source, a for forum post, uh, by one of the members of the background team that says that this age was about 2000 years ago. So it's one of few references we have to how long these ages are. And uh, I can give a spoiler that the current time in the ninth age is the year 962 uh, in that age basically. So that means from the 4th age, the 5th age, the 6th, 7th and 8th uh, were only a thousand years and now they are almost a thousand years into the ninth age. So these ages of ruin seem to be fairly short actually. So, um, and I'm going through them quite quickly as well. So we'll move on to the 5th age. Fifth age known as the Age of Plague and the Third of Ruin. It is um, seems to be a time of civil wars. The elves start a... Uh, are, are the elves are plunged in, the, the highborn elves are plunged into civil war. Uh, the colonies in Silexia are tired of being mistreated by the throne, the White Islands, the Pearl Throne, and they rebel, wanting independence, uh, and this also coincides with a revolt on the islands themselves, where I think uh, some uh, more el elves migrate off that island into Silexia and, and maybe to Vetia as well. Um, this is something that I like about, about the Ninth Age Fluff. <coughs> it's not just one mi migration wave of these people going here and forming this faction now. It's um, several waves of, of migration which um, forms starts to form a, a new culture in, a, in a, another place, uh, which seems fairly re realistic to me. Um, it said that the dwarves reconquer the White Mountains in the poem. Um, exactly when they lost it, who they lost it to and who they reconquer it from, it's not really said. And it also seems that they lose it again shortly after, as we will, or yeah, sometime after at least, uh, as we will see. Uh, because it is re retaken from orcs in the Eighth Age. We're going ahead of ourselves a bit. Uh, so, uh, the dwarves are also said to uh, deepen their alliance with uh, with Avras. They build the walls, it's, uh, it's said. Bring the gift of mountain and stone, I think the, the poem says. And Avras itself is also plunged into civil war. Um, in the main rulebook there's the tale about how this happens and there's some more sub information about it in the scroll about the vermin swarm. It's one of the early scrolls, I think. Um, but basically it's a few people. Uh, one Dexion, Gaius Dexion. Uh, a hero, a war hero, who um, uh, opposes the Senate and uh, the whole empire is plunged into civil war. And dur during the conflict, um, one Augustus something, I think his, his name was, um, makes a treaty with the 
vermin gods and unleashes the vermin swarm upon the world. The intention was of course to help his side in the civil war, but the vermin instead just take over everything. Um, one of the guys involved in this, maybe the, that one, uh, Augustus, is um, also, also down in the circle of Anadra in hell, being tortured by that uh, giant creature. Uh, so, so the ver vermin swarm is created, and they overtake Avras and they over uh, the city and swiftly move on to their whole empire, basically, conquering everything except for the kingdom of Equitain and the empire of Monopatia. Um, both of these are managed to survive. Uh, and uh, that's the end of the fifth age. We'll move on to the sixth. Um, the age of war, and the fourth of ruin. And it seems that it, this age is marked by um, war among the more uncivilized races uh, and species. So the dwarves, they appear to seal themselves in their mountains, um, while the the orcs, the the goblins, the beast herds, and the vermin swarm fight among themselves. So. There's, this is also the time, it seems, from the imagery that the Great Wall of Tsuanda is built. And there's also something in the imagery that I don't really know what it is. It seems to be some sort of goblin, maybe a hobgoblin, who is uh, chained in a dungeon. Um, don't know what that's to, supposed to represent. Um, and that's about it for this age. We'll move on to the seventh, which is the age of thunder, the fifth of the ruin. So the the eastern dwarves, who would later become known as the infernal dwarves, uh, they are very hard pressed during these these ages of ruin. Uh, unlike the other dwarven empire, the dwarven holds, basically. They are not able to seal themselves in the mountain and just ignore everything. They have to face it head on. And they, it's said that they, they turn to some darker arts to do this. Uh, among those arts is the binding of the Kadim. So fire demons, basically. Uh, and as they do it, do this, maybe because they are doing it, the world is plunged into further, further chaos and destruction. Uh, there are volcano eruptions and earthquakes and floods that plague the world. Um, But uh, I think uh, in in the scroll where there's uh, some background on them, uh, somewhere in the middle, maybe 12, issue 12 or something like that, um, they, they seem very successful though. Um, it really helps them, them out. <laughs> um, so that's good for them, I guess. Um, in Vetia, the Kingdom of Equitain, here we get the explanation perhaps to why they weren't uh, conquered by the vermin, because they uh, are ruled by the Dark King uh, Giles de Rohr, I think that's it, how his name 
is pronounced. I think it's Giles the Red, but in French. Um, there's a text about about him in one of the early scrolls, maybe issue number five, about the kingdom of Equitain. <coughs> and basically it seems that he's a vampire and his strength um, means that he can stand up to the verm vermin and uh, preserve Equitain from their influence. So there, there's an image in, in the world hymn where he stands atop some ver vermin, more vermin are impaled on poles and there are some human humans worshipping him. So yeah, guess it's good that he saved Equitain but uh, maybe not the best saver after all. But who knows. Um, also in Oega, the ogres, it's not really said when this happens, but it's before the end of the age, uh, before the end of the seventh age. Um, they are united in, under a single leader uh, called Quengheth Khan. Again, hard to pronounce some of the names. Um, so he, he rules a single great kingdom of ogres. Uh, later though, it is split up into five kingdoms. Um, and then we'll continue into the Eighth Age. And I think what we'll touch upon what happens to those five kingdoms <coughs> immediately. So the transitional point between the eighth, between the seventh and the eighth age, is the creation of the Inferno uh, by the Eastern Dwarfs, which then earns them the name Infernal Dwarfs. Um, so basically they continue to experiment dark, dark experiments and trying to survive and accidentally create a great magical firestorm uh, and sends out a shockwave of uh, destructive magic which creates the inferno no, not the inferno, it creates the wasteland uh, which is directly north of the inferno and it's theorized that the reason uh, that uh, the wasteland is was created not in a circle around uh, the inferno, but in in a um, the area north of it is because of the way that the Sigwarth where the experiment experiment was performed it was pointed. So the inferno is created, the wa wasteland is created. <clears throat> and this unleashes a horde of of demons and uh, warriors of the dark gods upon the world. Um, there haven't been much mention of the demons before this. They are mentioned in in the um, in the seventh age among the floods and quakes and uh, and. Um, such during that time there was also the demons um, but this is the first time that they appear in really great numbers it seems um, so um, there's also another mention of of warriors i should say dating back as old as to the the uh, empire of naptesh so it's somewhere in the second or third age um, where there's some uh, we have a source of some pottery where it's described how the how the living uh, soldiers of Naptesh fight, fight against um, chariots of the dark gods uh, but back to the eighth age. So the inferno is created and in its creation these 
five kingdoms of the ogres. Two of them are nearly obliterated by the blast. And the survi survivors are united under their hero uh, Tsanas, uh, who leads uh, the ogres to the Sky Mountains and establishes a stronghold there. He battles the <coughs> the demon Foloi the Skullbringer, who is probably a Scorch of Vanadra. Um, and there's <laughs> quite a lot of sources on, on Foloi actually, which is uh, interesting. Um, there's a poem in the main rule book about him, Tsanas. <coughs> and there's um, a text about him in the Demon Legions book too. And I think there was actually another poem about, uh, or another source about him maybe. Texts about the ogres in the Ninth Scroll mention him. Um, in Vetia, the forces of the Dark Gods and other destructive forces are also unleashed. Um, Brag, the Black Bull, leads an army of beast herds and of um, Dark God's followers and orcs, I think. It's a very varied force. He leads them against um, Vetia uh, from the wasteland, basically. And he comes across the Asgar and their king Varin <coughs> at the battle of the Gevache. Uh, and the, the, the Asgard, they, it's a human tribe. They basically don't, don't stand a chance against the might of Brag. Um, but the, their king Varin chooses to stand and fight with a, I think it's 99 warriors or something like that, to try and buy time uh, for he, the rest of his people to escape. More bottle shaking. Uh, <coughs> so they fight in a ford of the river, uh, Gevashe. And it's not going well for the, the Asgar. Uh, and that's uh, their king, Varin. Jewels Brag and is all, all but defeated. Um, the goddess Sunna, or maybe an immortal incarnation of her, appears um, and defeats Brag. The Asgar join forces with her. And they set out to unite the rest of the human tribes of Vetia. Uh, Uther of Equitane. He disobeys his king's order, King, king Giles, and joins for forces with Suno. They fight against someone called the Ancient One and drives him back to the sea. I think that's a Cthulhu reference. Uh, they also liberate the White Mountains from the Orcs who reside there, so the Dwarves somehow lost those, again, uh, and uh, unites, the, she unites with Arcalion, uh, from what will, would la later be known as Arcalia. And she also unites with Queen Yuneva um, of what would be known as Destria. Uh, they all fight in the Battle of Volsk, another river. 
uh, against a forces force of um, dark god fo followers, including ogres and mammoths. Uh, and it's a great fight. Uh, the river is frozen, allowing the the forces of evil basically to march across. But Suna man manages to part the clouds and melt the ice bridge, plunging them all into the water. Um, something like that. <coughs> um, so they proceed with their, <laughs> their their main mission basically, which is to liberate all of Vetia from the vermin swarm. So they march towards Avras fight a few of their armies uh, and are uh, sent a message by the, the Rat King to surrender or be destroyed basically um, and uh, Suna chooses to fight against the caution of Varin uh, Varin is then approached by another uh, group of vermin and given a sword that sa that is said to be able to slay a goddess and encouraged to uh, betray Suna. Um, so they march on Avras and uh, they the fight begins. Suna seeks out the Rat King um, together with uh, Arcadion, I think. Yeah. The Rat King slays Arcadion, and now that Suna is alone, uh, Varin strikes and stabs her in the back. A mortal wound, but she still manages to fight on and defeat the Rat King. Varin disappears <coughs> and the vermin swarm are defeated. Though Suna dies. Um, it seems that in, in the um, circling the abyss it is suggested that uh, Varin did survive and pledged his soul to Kulima, goddess of envy and is now called simply the Betrayer and the third mouth of Panadra is, is meant for him but he's still alive so he's not placed there yet uh, that's speculation though it's not written in certainty <coughs> so uh, that's the end of the eighth age with the liberation of Avras uh, and the destruction of the vermin swarm who are driven back in, into not driven back really but, but dr driven into into the earth forced to hide um, so yeah um, we'll move on, on to the ninth age, the last age, uh, the current age at least, no? um, which is a an age marked of expansion and exploration, especially among the hum humans. So, Uther, who joined Suna, he returns to Equitain and uh, dethrones uh, Giles and uh, becomes the king of Equitain and forms the knightly orders that are still around today um, the wor world hymn is carved by the dwarves 
and in in the year 201 AS, which, which presumably stands for after Sanna, the Empire of Sonstal is founded. Um, their first emperor is probably uh, Leopold True True Hearted. It's not written explic <coughs> explicitly, but it's written that he gives a speech on the day of its of the uh, the nation is founded. Um, so yeah, I think it's like likely that he is the first emperor. Um, Gonglu claims the throne of Swanda, uh, known as the Dragon Emperor. Emperor. Um, some sources suggest that he's lit literally a dragon. I say that it's likely that he is. <coughs> uh, other sources suggest that he's a Saurian. And there are some, some tales of the people of Suanda having be, been ruled by Saurians in the past. So, yeah, who knows. Um, more events in the Ninth Age. Um, in the imagery it seems that they are starting to colonize uh, Videncia. You can see some Saurians hiding in the bushes and some boats coming near. Uh, and there's also something that looks like a wedding in the image. And this could very well, well be the wedding between um, Sophia, Empress Sophia of Destria, and Emperor Matthias of Sonstad. Um, also, the uh, Avras is conquered by General Fontaine, and who then seems to betray Equitaine and takes the throne for himself, possibly with help from his queen. Who is described as ever young, maybe a vampire. I f forgot to mention that in the um, age, uh, fourth age, was it? Fifth eighth age when Avras uh, plunged into civil war and the vermin swarm cre was created. This Gaius Dexion, the war hero, also had a an ab ever young queen. Uh, so possibly a vampire, possibly even the same vampire as the one in Avras today. Uh, so that's pretty neat. Um, there's of course lots of happening in the Ninth Age. Uh, big and small. I think I'll settle for mentioning that the... I think in the year 960 the current king of Equitaine is crowned Henry the Young and today it's the year 962 so <coughs> I think that's that's it for the nine ages of the world so painting wise I've just about finished the freehanding of the shields. I finish them up and then put, take a picture. Um, it was a little bit trickier to <coughs> paint the freehand than I had hoped, but I think it turns out good. So it's worth it, I think. Even though I had said that this would be a speed pro painting project. Uh, I'm gonna freehand some hundred shields or so. <coughs> Great idea. Um, but yeah, I post a picture of that and uh, 
that's it for this episode. Thank you for listening. And I'll see you on the next one. Cheers.